So I'd like to dedicate this talk to Robert Barrett, Jr. Um, some of you know him, some of you do not. Um, he was a ninth grade English teacher in um, Silverdale in Kitsap County in the state of Washington who for many years turned his, and this man was on fire, no question about it, he turned hundreds of ninth graders onto this subject. Uh, he nearly lost his job at one point because of it, uh, but uh, he fought back. Uh, that, uh, I've been in touch with his daughter Katie, he just passed away uh, within the last two or three days, and so I wanted to be sure to mention him. Uh, this is the first paragraph of the article that he wrote, uh, published in, what was it, the fall 2006 issue of Shakespeare Matters. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, Robert Frost wrote in 1914, using iambic pentameter and inverted syntax that are nearly Shakespearean in his blunt but memorable line. The line speaks for me personally in a very particular way. When I finished reading The Mysterious William Shakespeare by Charlton Ogburn Jr., something there was within me that didn't love the wall that hid the true Shakespeare. So I'm going to talk to you about a project that Alexander Waugh and I are working on. It's called The New Shakespeare Illusion Book. My, my public title for the talk was Leveraging the Shakespeare Illusion Book. The private esoteric subtitle is Our Slingshot. This is our working title page. Literary Illusions to Shakespeare, 1584 to 1786 from historical principles, and I'm going to talk about that historical principle in just a minute. So uh, Alexander Waugh is here. You heard him yesterday speak about uh, one of the most interesting pieces in this book. Uh, it is currently in manuscript 755 pages and counting, so it's a big book. It includes uh, approximately 200 separate illusions spanning the two-century period, 1584 to 1786. Uh, Alexander and I met online, I think it was 2015, I didn't actually double-check this, countering the ox frauds, for those of you who know who they are. Um, via Facebook discussion and email, we agreed to a, a double joint project, the Shakespeare Illusion Book and a De Vere, Earl of Oxford Illusion Book, of which the first part is nearly completed and the second is started. Uh, we, used, we have been using the cloud to exchange a mostly relatively trouble-free transcontinental transmission of files in a collaborative project. Currently, the manuscript is undergoing fine-tuning and late additions. And here's part of the good news. Alexander's agent is enthusiastic about selling it to a major academic publisher. We don't know if that's going to happen. We at least have, uh, you know, enthused professionals who would like to see that happen. This is a reference book. This is not going to replace uh, any of the wonderful, more popular books that have been written over the last few years. It's, uh, the illusions themselves are mostly original spelling facsimiles. We decided not to do long S's, but other than that, we're following uh, the original spelling of the documents, uh, and as I mentioned, about 200 of the most important early Shakespeare illusions. What does this include? It includes every published and manuscript reference to the name Shakespeare, 1593 to 1642, excepting a few play quartos, although even most of those are included in the book in one way or another. And then it includes major and representative allusions to Shakespeare plays, texts, or circumstances, 1593 to 1786. And uh, selected references to the name Shakespeare during the later period, 1643 to 1786. This is how we broke down the chronology uh, we have what we call the prehistory section, which goes from 1584 to 1597. 
That currently contains about 33 plus references. The invention of the author, and you'll see in just a minute why we uh, designate 1598 as the year of the invention of the author, uh, to 1603. Uh, from revision to misattribution, an interesting thing that happens is that after 1604, two things happen. One is we get no new play quartos that state there's revision by the author. And the second is we start to get pseudo-Shakespearean plays published under the name Shakespeare. Hmm, somebody's missing from the scene uh, and is not revising and is not stopping uh, the publishers from uh, playing fast and loose with his name. Uh, then we have a section uh, that goes to 1616, conveniently marking the death of the alleged author. And then from 1617 to 1625, we have a section that includes the folio references. Uh, and then two uh, later periods, we break this at 1642 because, of course, that's the moment at which uh, under Cromwell, uh, that the uh, theaters are closed. So that's an important historical uh, distinction right there. So a uh, little bit about historical principles. The data is strictly arranged chronologically so that historical relationships can be accurately ascertained. And it also includes a chronological survey of secondary literature on every illusion both Orthodox and post stratfordian or Oxfordian. Now, it's worth emphasizing that there is no other book that does even the first part of this, let alone examines the Orthodox secondary criticism in relationship to what uh, uh, the post stratfordians have done. Um, I actually have a link here. I think I'm not going to do this, but I do want to mention Shakespeare documented online. If you have not seen this site, you should look at it. This is the Stratfordian response to what we are doing. And it does include a wonderful database of original images, most of them accessible under Creative Commons license. So in this book, we have a paradoxical relationship with Shakespeare documented. We frequently have used their images with attribution, but we are also going to hold their feet to the fire because much of the commentary here is extremely dishonest. So that brings me to the final bullet point here. There is, has been a systematic pattern of evasive editorial policies lasting up until Shakespeare documented that we... Uh, are going to uh, document and respond to in this book. So another thing that the book does is it makes... Oh, and you know what? I just forgot. I've got handouts. Uh, I, I have two handouts for you. I've got a, a sheet that uh, goes over what I'm going to talk about today. And I also have copies uh, that I'm going to give you of a marvelous pamphlet. It was published in... Uh, uh, only in 1993, um, by Richard Kennedy, whom some of you know. Richard Kennedy is a brilliant contemporary novelist and creative fiction writer. And this uh, pamphlet is called Between the Lines. And uh, what he does, the, the text here is from Kennedy's pamphlet. It's actually about uh, 10 or 12 pages long, and he has a, a little... Um, two lines of verse for every one of his images. And the point of this pamphlet is that these lines, it's not showing up. Well, you see these lines right here on the sonnet title page, he is suggesting that there's something significant about the absence there. So what I've done to you in this slide is shown you this is typical. This is a normal Elizabethan, early modern title page. Well, it's not, this is not Elizabethan, it's Jacobean. Um, and you notice that there are two sets of lines here, and there's something in between both of them. There is a printer's device uh, and the name of the author. So um, what Kennedy argues, he says, for hundreds of years, a common design, the author's name printed between two lines. And then the punchline, he, he shows a whole series of these title pages, all of them 
with the author's name between the two lines. And then he gets to the sonnets and says, a Shakespearean riddle. Here's the game. Why put in the lines and leave out the name? Now, after we published this, we got some pushback. And some Stratfordians went back to the original documents and they said, well, wait a minute. There's nothing in between the lines on John, John Donne's title page of his poems either. Ergo, it doesn't mean anything as usual. The anti-Stratfordians are barking up an empty tree. Well, I could talk to you for quite a bit of time about this title page and why, like the sonnet title page, there is a reason why there's a blank space there. This was not a one-off. Elizabethan publishers were not stupid. They knew how to use uh, visual design to create effects. In this case, the effect is something's missing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm just going to show you, go straight to the punchline here. Look at this. This, in the course of researching this problem, is the sort of stuff that Alexander and I began to find. Here are two early modern title pages. One of them is that same John Donne title page. That is a signature of John Donne from another document that has been pasted into the space. This is an anonymous uh, uh, text that Ben Johnson, by the way, wrote a, a poem, an introductory poem to, with the name of the author written into it. So early modern readers, when they saw this blank space between the two lines, felt there was something missing and they put it there. Okay? So we use visual evidence, uh, I think, to great effect in this book. So let me just show you what each illusion looks like, though. So on this side, this is the uh, traditional Ingleby illusion book that we are uh, that we're imitating and superseding and going beyond. You can see it consists of only one page. This is the um, illusion that many of you are familiar with, John Davies of Hereford to our English Terence, Mr. Will Shake hyphen Spear, about which even the Stratfordians have been forced to admit there's something a little bit curious. So we give the illusion in original spelling, then we give the title... These titles, by the way, are interesting, folks. They're, they wrote very long titles, and there's quite a bit you can learn just by reading the whole title. So we want to include the whole title. Then we have a short entry on the source and context. In this case, that includes the stationer's register entry uh, some in, and some other sort of m the page number on which the illusion appears and that sort of material. Then we do a complete survey, as complete as we've been able to come up with any way of orthodox opinion. In this case, we also do glosses to the poem because there are certain key terms that we think it's important to sort of focus the reader's attention on. Then we get to, only then, only after we've done all that, do we get to our commentary. And I'm... Um, this is an example of some of the juicy stuff we get if you look beyond merely the illusion itself. This is from Diana Price. To my knowledge, she was the first one to do this. She looked at the order of poems in this uh, book, uh, 155, to my worthily disposed friend, Mr. Samuel Daniel, to my well-accomplished friend, Mr. Ben Johnson, to my much esteemed Mr. Inigo Jones, our English Zeuxis and Vitruvius, to my worthy, kind friend, Mr. Isaac Simmons. What? To our English Terence, Mr. William Shakespeare, followed by to his Notice the his is ambiguous here. It, that could refer to Shakespeare as well as to John Davies of Hereford, to his most constant and most unknown friend, nobody, to my near, dear, well-known friend, somebody. 
Now it seems to me that even a Stratfordian should be able to see that there's a problem with this sequence. This is the kind of subtle thing that these people did. And then we just got a couple more pages, and then at the end, so this, as you can see, this entry is about six or eight pages long. The average is probably a little bit shorter than this, but some of the entries are even longer, depending upon the complexity. And at the end, we have a complete list of references that have been used and are relevant to that entry. Okay, so this is the first book to ever fully and comprehensively examine the Shakespeare question at its root and burrow beneath the assumptions and take command of the intellectual territory that Stratfordians have always assumed they owned and over which there was no real contest. It also allows us for the first time to begin examining the relationships between these illusions to apply a model of what scholars call a, a discourse analysis to show that at least some of these illusions are responding to some of the others in a form of a literary conversation. So I'm going to give you a metaphor here. As recently as the 1920s, many of the best astronomers in the world still believed in a one galaxy universe. So we're going to go beyond the one galaxy universe here. The New Illusion book disproves, definitively disproves, the common assertion that the authorship question did not exist until circa 1805 or whatever date you want to pick. More than two-thirds of these illusions make obvious in one way or another, as we just saw in the Davies example, that the name Shakespeare is a pseudonym. So contrary to orthodox dogma, we can now insist that the authorship question does not begin in the 1790s or in 1850, it begins in the 1590s. How have we missed this? Well, our conditioning has not prepared us to evaluate the evidence for the early modern authorship question. We don't think to look at the order of the poems and see if they're giving us some sort of meta-commentary on the contents of each individual poem. We still believe we live in a one galaxy universe. Now think about this. We believe, and I'm including the Stratfordians and all of us in this we, we believe, this is what we're taught, that the goal of the written text, any written text, is to achieve transparency and clarity for any and every reader. This was not their belief. And I'll fill in some detail on that by the time we finish. Those are not stars. Each one of those bright lights is a Milky Way unto itself. So I'm going to talk now. This concludes my general overview. And now I'm going to talk um, uh, for a few minutes about each of three main illusions. These are three of the most complicated and most interesting and powerful illusions that I think we deal with. So the first one happens in 1592, and that's uh, Green's Groat's Worth of Wit. Then in 1598, we get the establishment. This is coming back to the point of the fact that we do not really get the invention of Shakespeare as the author of dramas until 1598. And it coincides with the cryptogram that I'm going to show for you about authorship that identifies Oxford as the real author in Mears' Pilatus Tamiya. And then in 1623, we're going to see Ben Jonson using a slightly different variation on what Francis Mears does, also confirming that Oxford was the author. So uh, I'm going to do three slides quickly here with a rhetorical question. What if Green's Groat's Worth of Wit doesn't actually refer to Shakespeare in 1592? Now, I heard in uh, Sabrina Feldman's presentation that, according to her, the most straightforward, that was the word that she used, interpretation of Green's Groat's Worth of Wit is that it does refer to Shakespeare. I'm going to show you that it does not. Oops, what happened? 
So if this doesn't refer to Shakespeare, then guess what? Let's think about the implications. The Stratfordians then have no biography of the bard at all until 1598. What if Pallidus Tamiya, the only document uh, uh, of the 1590s that refers to Shakespeare in any extensive commentary as a dramatic writer, also aims to veer Earl of Oxford as the real author of the plays. Well then, the Stratfordians have no record of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's authorship of plays and instead must deal with the reality that Mears is the very first Oxfordian. He may be shilling for the orthodox view, but he's going to covertly tell us very clearly that Oxford is the real writer. And what if Johnson more closely examined than he has been so far, explicitly joins Mears, also saying that De Vere is the author, then, hmm, that's pretty much the end of the game, as far as I can tell. They don't have anything left. So let's look at these one by one. Uh, as all of you know, this is the earliest known alleged allusion to Shakespeare as an actor playwright. I've given a quote here from Shakespeare documented what's going on interestingly right now. The Stratfordians are desperately trying to pin this work on somebody other than Robert Greene. And I'm not going to say there is not some question about that, but this is not an accurate summary of current scholarship. Contemporary scholars are divided over who wrote this. And most of them agree that even if Chettle wrote it or had uh, a lot to do with it, it is written from the point of view of Robert Greene, as you might suppose if it's got Greene's groats worth of wit on the title page. This is the passage. Base-minded men, all three of you, he's writing, generally believed to be writing to Peel. Uh, Nash and Marlowe here, three playwrights, base-minded men, if by my misery you be not warned. For unto none of you, like me, sought those burrs to cleave, those puppets, I mean. So he's complaining about actors, the puppets, the actors that spake from our mouths, those antics garnished in our colors. Is it not strange that I, to whom they have all been beholding, is it not like that you, to whom they have all been beholding, shall, were ye in that case as I am now, Green is in debt and dying as he writes this, uh, uh, be both at once of them forsaken. In other words, won't these actors abandon you also the way they abandoned me? Yes, trust them not. For there is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart, wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you. And being an absolute Johannes factotum, is in his only conceit, the, in his own conceit, the only shake scene in a country. A factotum just means a jack of all trades. So, what does this say? Well, Green is attacking an actor who presumes to write plays and even rewrites or plagiarizes plays written by real playwrights like himself. Now, one of the interesting things about this passage is if he is talking about Shakespeare, there's not really any reason to understand why he would be attacking Shakespeare in this manner unless he's just envious. So one of the th ways Stratfordians have dealt with this is they pile this whole psychobabble on top of Robert Greene. Oh, he was such an envious bastard. He's attacking our hero. Our hero hasn't even really got on stage, and Greene is already attacking him because he went to the university, and our hero didn't go to the university. That's essentially the logic. So Stratfordians must bend over backward, attributing to Greene envy of Shakespeare. Now... I like to go back to the original. This is the first statement in the secondary literature uh, attributing this passage as an attack on Shakespeare. And it's from Thomas Turwitt writing to George Stevens. Notice the language here. There can be no doubt 
I think that Shake's scene alludes to Shakespeare or that his tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide is a parody on York's speech to Margaret in 3rd Henry VI. Actually, uh, Troublesome Reign. So, um, the there can be no doubt part concerns me. This is not straightforward. This is there can be no doubt from the very beginning. There was no critical inquiry here. There was no testing of hypotheses. There was just, we need this so badly that there can be no doubt that it's true. Oh, and look at that. Jonathan Bate, 1997. What is that? I didn't do the math, but hundreds of years later, this is how Jonathan Bate apparently does a literature survey. There can be no doubt that this refers to Shakespeare. Interestingly enough, however, Stanley Wells, always a little bit more thoughtful than some of the extremists in his own camp, admits we cannot say definitively that it refers to Shakespeare. Well, this difference might reflect simply the two scholars, but is there anything that happened between the time that those two statements were made? Well, actually, look at this. This is a list of scholars, both Marlovian and Oxfordian, who since 1993 have suggested that actually this is a reference to Edward Alain, not to Shakespeare. J. Hoster, 93, Marlovian, A.D. Wright, Daryl Pinkson, and Peter Ferry are all Marlovians. Stephanie Hughes, kudos to Stephanie. She got on this early in, in 1997. Robert Dedabell, 2010. Catherine Chiljohn, in what I'm going to show you, is really still the best treatment of this in 2010. Brian Wildenthal, who is here in the most recent issue of the Oxfordian, and then Waugh and Strip Matter forthcoming. So what is this based on? Why do we say that it was Edward Alain? Who was Edward Alain? He is a physically imposing and charismatic lead actor with a booming voice, celebrated for his noisy performances of the thunderous conqueror of Marlowe's tragedy, Tamburlaine. He became notorious in the early 1590s for rewriting or imitating plays by Robert Greene, among others. And he is most likely the author of the anonymous play Fair M, a play that is alluded to contemptuously in Greene's Groat's Worth of Wit. He is also a businessman, a moneylender, an entrepreneur, and a theater manager. He became very wealthy, wealthy enough to found Dulwich College. That's why poor playwrights like Robert Greene don't like him. So it's not about Greene's envy of Shakespeare, who is otherwise, let's remember this, not attested at all on the historical record in the London theater scene in 1592. And in 1592, Elaine was in a live dispute with Green involving accusations of profiteering and plagiarism. Before Grotesworth, according to Catherine Children, Green had slammed Elaine and Tamburlaine, his most famous play, at least four times in print. And a few months before Grotesworth was published, uh, Elaine's company performed Third Henry VI at the Rose Theater with Alain himself probably cast in the role of Richard, Duke of York, who speaks the lines about the tiger's heart. Hello. <laughs> Correct. And actually, everything on this illusion uh, is really, it, a lot of it's in Brian's article, and it's in uh, Catherine Children's chapter in her book. Right, okay, so she really, so yeah. So uh, again, he, here's Green attacking Elaine in 1590. Why, Rocious, thou art proud with Aesop's crow. Oh, it's the same metaphor even. Being pranked with the glory of others' feathers. 
What sentence thou utterest on the sage flows from the censure of our wits. I grant your action, though it be a kind of mechanical labor. Yet, well done, tis worthy of praise. And according to Peter Alexander, Green uses the same terms in describing Elaine in Francesco's fortune as he does in his attack on Shakespeare. And Samuel Schoenbaum says Rocious in Francesco's fortune stands for Elaine. They've done a lot of the heavy lifting for us here, people. So this is the best general introduction to this. So I put this thing about don't tell me because I have, ha I have heard um, some certain bloggers say, well, you know, I read Jay Hoster's pamphlet, our, our book in 1993, and it didn't impress me. Well, it didn't impress me that much either. What impressed me is what Catherine does in this book, building on Hoster. So this is the case to beat. So what does she do? She attributes and organizes into a coherent account the prior, mostly Marlovian scholarship. And this theory is grounded in detailed contemporary theater history. So we're going to wrap up this one right here. We have used a fairly standard biographical and historical methodology to contextualize the Green's Grotesworth illusion. It refers to Edward Elaine, not William Shakespeare or even William Shakespeare, who had yet to be invented. Therefore, Stratfordians can no longer rely on this to establish a starting point for the Orthodox biography. Now let's talk about Pallidus to Mia. This is the title page, 1598. What is this book? It's a 340 page, what's called a commonplace book. This is a genre that we don't have anymore, but it's very important in medieval and early modern literature. It's a tiny book. I was gonna bring my, my, my modern facsimile of it to show you. It's only five, by, uh, five and a half by three inches, but it's fat, okay? So what is a commonplace book? Well, a commonplace book is basically uh, a collection of wisdom sayings. In this case, arranged in what's called similitudes or comparisons. And I'll show you an example in just a minute so that will become clear. Within the book, there is a separate section called a comparative discourse of our English poets with the Greek and Latin and Italian poets, which includes approximately 60 separate similitudes. And this contains the first prose analysis of Shakespeare, really the first analysis of any kind of Shakespeare as a literary phenomenon and as a playwright. There are a total of nine references to Shakespeare here. And here's where it gets really interesting. This book is published within weeks of the first appearance of the name Shakespeare on a play quarto. And before we move on, we're going to look at that second to the last bullet point, but let's pay attention a little bit to this Latin motto in the title page. It says, by wit he lives, all else perishes. That's going to be on the quiz and we're going to come back to it. This is the part of Mir's book that has made this so important to Orthodox Shakespeareans. Remember I said these are all similitudes or comparisons. So in every single one, we're going to have an as and a so. So in this case, as Plautus and Seneca are accounted the best for comedy and tragedy among the Latins, so Shakespeare among the English is the most excellent in both kinds for stage. Notice we get a balance here. We got comedy and tragedy on one side, on the as side, and we got comedy and tragedy on the other side. Only it took two of the ancients to equal our Shakespeare. Okay, so we have balance, but we also have difference that is to the benefit of Shakespeare. And then what follows from that is examples of both kinds of uh, writing for the stage, both the comedy and the tragedy of Shakespeare. We get 12 plays, six comedies and six tragedies. Four of them are unknown from any other source at this time, which tells us that Mears has an inside track here. He knows what's going on. Stephen Greenblatt says that by the 1590s, Shakespeare was a celebrity. Now, if we asked Stephen Greenblatt to prove that, how would he do it? He would do it with this book. It's the only way he could do it. This is the Stratfordian trump card. Let's keep that in mind as we proceed.
And don't forget, Vivitur in Genio, by wit he lives. Okay? So, guess what? Until the publication of Pallidus to Mia, these are the only publications or manuscripts that use the name Shakespeare. Willoughby, his, the two narrative poems, right, in 93 and 94. Willoughby, his Avisa, which we've seen talked about. Palamentea, which Alexander Waugh has written uh, uh, wonderfully and incredibly about. And then we get the unpublished Northumberland manuscript. We don't really know when that was written. They say 1597, but it's not published. Uh, that does indicate Shakespeare is the author of history plays. And then John Weaver's poems, which are sometimes said to have been written in 1595, but are not published until 1599. So I'm, I'm emphasizing this so you can see how important and singular Francis Mears actually is. Meanwhile, the Shakespeare plays are coming out. They just don't have any name on them. Nine of them, canonical plays. That does not include things like The uh, Taming of a Shrew uh, and, and the, the history plays that Ramon Jimenez has been writing about. Uh, that we also think are by the same person. All of those are also anonymous. So look at what this looks like. The Tragedy of King Richard II in 1598 by William Shake hyphen Spear. Here's what this looked like one year earlier in 1597. No name on the title page. Same publisher, same printer. What happened in 1598? Well... Francis Mears got the green light to go ahead and do what he did. So now the name's on the title page. Before 1598, we have zero plays with the name Shakespeare on the title page. And in the two years between 1598 and 1600, we get eight plays with the name on the title page. A few continue to still appear, like the... Uh, additional quartos of Romeo and Juliet anonymously, but it seems like most of the publishers got the message. So we have to drill down here a little bit to understand what Francis Mears is doing. So this is uh, what do bathkeepers and philosophers have in common? This is my favorite slide, I think. Well, they say the bathkeepers of Asia and Grecia, when they would drive the people from them, make a smoke in them with darnel and cockle, which causeth a swimming in the head. So, okay, here's the similitude part. So philosophers, as often as they would remove the unlearned multitude from their writings, uh, include certain mathematical numbers and figures, which do breed such a giddiness and a dizziness in their heads that they cast away their books. This is from Pliny. Almost everything in mirrors is recycled. Remember I said these are wisdom sayings. This is strange to us. If you're not thinking that, it's, if, you're, if you're thinking you're supposed to immediately grasp the significance of this, you're not. Let's break it down. Oops. So there are two things I want to emphasize here that he's doing that are weird to us. The first is there's an emphasis on hermetic or esoteric purpose. Philosophers need to exclude the impatient and the unlearned multitude from their teachings. Remember I said we think the goal of the philosopher is to be transparent to everybody or really any writer. They don't think that. Francis Mears doesn't think it. The second is the emphasis on the idea of mathematical numbers and figures to achieve this purpose. What could that mean? What is he talking about? If we can wrap our minds around these two aspects of early modern thinking, we will be well on our way to perceiving the real multi-galaxy universe of these early allusions to Shakespeare. I keep hitting the wrong button here. Sorry. So I got one slide here about esotericism and one slide about math. So... Uh, by the way, I have to thank Richard Wagaman for drawing our attention to this really important book. I highly recommend this book. It may not be an easy read, but it's a terrifically important study which shows that with very few exceptions, every early modern writer believed in the necessity of secret writing in one form or another. 
It's by Arthur M. Melzer, who demonstrates in the book that this belief lasted well into the 18th century. And its tradition is recorded even by leading Enlightenment figures like Voltaire, who still believes that one must never give, sorry, typo there, one must never give anything under one's own name. And the philosopher or satirist must strike and conceal your hand. And this is from the publisher's uh, blurb online. Uh, I think it's University of Chicago. Philosophical esotericism, the practice of communicating one's unorthodox thoughts between the lines was a common practice until the end of the 18th century. But what about numerology? Well, ultimately, this is Pythagorean in origin. Pythagoras is a fascinating figure, very important. We don't understand his importance. What did he teach? He taught that number, not material, not atoms, not electrons, not quarks, but number is the fundamental building block of the universe. To write in numbers also was to write poetry. Think about it. Early modern poetry, anything up until modern free verse, poetry is a numbered way of writing. And there's a long bibliography on this. Lots of orthodox scholars have written about this. They're marginalized, as we are, within the field, but they have covered this very extensively. And just as one possible reference in this article, this is by me, but it gives a very good summary, I think, of the whole history of this field and the contributions of people like Kent Hyatt and Alistair Fowler. So remember that we said that viviture in genio, caterer mortis errant, he lives by wit, all else will die. This is one of the things I found in doing this that just blew my socks off. This is a card printed in 1547 by the same man who printed Copernicus's De Revolutionibus in 1543. And it adds to the legend that is reproduced on Mears' title page a second part. So he makes it into a couplet, basically, a Latin couplet. And that is translated this way. He sure it lives by wit, all else passes away. As gold is proved by fire, wit is proved by mathematics. So here's my question. Does Francis Mears think that wit is proved by mathematics? Yes, he does. And I'm going to show you. Well, first of all, one year before Palladistamia, Francis Mears wrote a book called God's Arithmetic. This is all sacred numerology. So it may be a year, maybe a year and a half. It's right in the same time frame. It's a pro-marriage tract. Okay, that's one of the purposes of it. But he, it's also a treatise in numerology. And he establishes a refrain in this book. Two is better than one. Consistent with his recommendation that, you know, that marriage is a good thing. Two is better than one. Here's another passage from God's Arithmetic. The ancient fathers and philosophers have singularly extolled the knowledge of humane arithmetic, being one of the seven liberal sciences, when they considered the deep devices, the profound practices, and cunning conclusions contained in arithmetic, and also that it is the key and entrance into all other arts and learning, as well the noble philosopher Pythagoras, who caused this inscription to be written upon his school door where he taught philosophy in great letters. I love that sentence because it keeps, you keep get a, 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 as you move on and you get a bigger and bigger sense of emphasis here. Let none enter here that is ignorant of arithmetic. Now, a few years ago at Concordia, Alan Nelson was present. Alan Nelson has written about Francis Mears, and he protested that he didn't believe this stuff about Francis Mears, anything having to do with numbers in it. Well, he needs to read the man he's writing about, because the man he's writing about says, you don't get into my school if you don't pay attention to arithmetic. 
So let's apply the principles of God's arithmetic to the logical dimension of Mears' comparative discourse. I am building here on the extraordinary work of Robert Dedabell and Casey Legan, which I was fortunate enough to help publish in the 2009 issue of Brief Chronicles. According to them, so remember we said we have the so and the as part of the similitude? According to them, whenever you can count things on either side of it, there's either the same number in the so side, in the as side, in the so side, or you get uh, maybe off by one. And what are the rules where you can be off by one? Well, one name can stand for two persons, as in the example where there is a mismatch between the classical and the English side. There's one too few names on the English side, and one of the names in the list is John Davies. Well, guess what? There were two English epigra epigrammatists called John Davies. Uh, so one name can stand for two people, and then you can see that one of them has been hidden. Two persons can have the same name. The numbers of names can be the same, while the numbers of persons are different, or vice versa. These are some of the observations that Dedabell and Legan made about this. So this is, the, this is sort of the ground zero here. This is the list that includes both Shakespeare and the Earl of Oxford in it. And I'm not going to bother to read over the whole thing. We have a, a, a bunch of uh, Greek uh, and, and Latin comic writers. As we're going to see, there's 17 of them. And then after we get the so side, beginning with Edward Earl of Oxford and ending with Henry Chettle, we're going to get only 16, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. We have 16 on top and we have 17 on the bottom. Now, how have the Stratfordians interpreted this? This is O.J. Campbell from Columbia University in 1940 reviewing Loney. If the list proves that Oxford was a successful writer of comedies, it proves just as clearly that Shakespeare was too. And it establishes the separate identity of the two dramatists. But does it really? Here's how Dedabell and Legan analyzed this. 16 ancient names, 17 English ones. They said there's an extra name on the English side. Well, and then they said, well, we don't have to count them all. Uh, it must be that the two names, because we know there's all this other evidence suggesting that Oxford was Shakespeare, those must be the duplicated names. I came behind them, and I want to give you an even better answer than that with the benefit of their work. What if we apply Mears' refrain from God's arithmetic that two is better than one? Will that lead us anywhere? So, in other words, what I want to know is, is there any kind of relationship within the paragraphs of the different names one to another? This is paragraph 33. It's the one immediately before the one we were just looking at. And look at what we have here. We've got two plays on either side. We've got an ancient play of Medea and an ancient play of the burning of Troy and a modern play of Richard III and a modern play of the destruction of Jerusalem. I've put this in a table on this slide so we can see exactly what's going on. In the correct order... We've got two plays about tyrants and two plays about the destruction of cities. So these are arranged in a systematic fashion. What happens if we apply that logic to this paragraph 34? Well, we have to decide where we're going to start because we've got an extra name on the English side. So I said Oxford, it's got to be zero, Okay. Oxford should be zero. Why should Oxford be zero? Well, the zero is the fool in the tarot deck. Also, he's been zeroed out, right? We know he's been left out. So the proverbial association between the fool and nothing is a basis for much of the dialogue between the fool and Kent and the fool and Lear. So Shakespeare knows about this. So how do these things line up? Do they work? Well, we got Menander among the ancients compared to Gager among the Elizabethans. Menander's famous lost play was called Drunkenness. Gager is criticized for plays with inebriated characters. 
Uh, let's go down to five. We don't have a lot of time. Nicostratos wrote Tokistes, the usurer. Thomas Lodge wrote Alarum against usurers. And Alexandridis Rhodius became famous for love plays, and so did Robert Greene. I love these. Archippus Athenaeus' most famous play was called The Fishes. Thomas Nash was just about to publish his Praise of the Red Herring, published a year, out of, uh, not even a full year, months later by the same publisher who published Mears' book. Uh, Terence, a translator, wrote adaptations of the Greek Menander. Chapman, also a translator, wrote adaptations of the Roman Terence. So I think we have sufficient basis to conclude that it looks like there's some kind of purposeful matching going on here. So I know you're dying to ask. Who does Shakespeare line up with? Well, let's find out. Arista, who? Aristonemus? What does Aristonemus mean, Bill? Well, the anonymous aristocrat. Well, very close, very close. Uh, before we get to the answer, let's look at one more principle. This is from the beginning of Palatistomia. The introduction begins, again, with a numerological principle. So we have not only uh, two is better than one, but three is soon omnia. Everything comes in threes, according to Francis Mears. We're going to be able to apply that as well. So we have this problem here. We've got um, Edward Earl of Oxford and Shakespeare aligned as English poets. And we've got uh, Shakespeare and Aristonemus lined up by position. What's the connection between Aristonemus and Edward Earl of Oxford? So that we have two knowns. Yeah, you, you are doing well. We're doing well. Shakespeare and Oxford, I just went over that. We don't have to say that. So here's the point. If we can find a strong link between Oxford and Aristonemus, and also between Shakespeare and Aristonemus, we will solve and comprehend Mir's puzzle according to the principle that all things come in threes. So let's start, before we get to the name, let's start with who this guy was. A fourth century BCE Athenian playwright, ridiculed Aristophanes for using a front man to produce his plays. That's how Aristophanes started off. And in fact, that's one of the few things that's remembered about Arist Aristonemus. None of his plays survive, but this legend, this tradition survives uh, and would have been well known to Francis Mears that um, he ridiculed Aristophanes for using a front man. And this is just giving the source of this. I have to thank my online friend, Nitwitted, whom some of you may have seen posting, she drug this up after she learned that I was pursuing this. So now here we get to the name. It lean, means quite literally the aristocratic name. Aristos, the best, the noblest, the bravest. Cognate with English aristocratic and onoma, which is Greek for name uh, or, or, or Latin nomen. Those are just my sources. So, conclusion of this section. Francis Mears, while responsible for Shakespeare becoming a celebrity in his own, clear, uh, in the 1590s, also tells us, according to his own clearly articulated numerical principles, that Shakespeare is a literary cutout, concealing the Earl of Oxford. So to understand this, we need to learn something about early modern conventions of numerical esotericism that we will now apply in our third and, I promise you, much briefer example. But uh, we needed to go through that, the, 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 the numerological and esoteric dimension to also understand Ben Jonson. So my third example is this 10-line poem from the first folio. To the reader, this figure that thou here seest put, it was for the gentle Shakespeare cut. Wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life 
Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face. The print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. But since he cannot, reader, look not on his picture but his book. This is just a little bit of context here. I want to show you what Ben Johnson wrote to one of the two dedicatees, uh, William uh, Pembroke, William Herbert, uh, a few years before the folio in his book of epigrams, which he dedicated to Pembroke. While you cannot change your merit, I dare not change your title. It was I that made it, and not I, under which name, I here offer to your lordship the ripest of my studies, my epigrams, which, though they carry danger in the sound, do not therefore seek your shelter. For when I made them, I had nothing in my conscience to the expressing of which I did need a cipher. This is a public advertisement and a request for patronage, and he's telling Pembroke, not only did I not wrong anybody in these poems, even though they carry danger in the sound of them, and typically epigrams are highly satirical and social and do attack not only social foibles but individuals, but, well, you know, if I had need of it, I can do this cipher stuff, okay? It's really downplaying, but that's what he's saying here, you know. If you need me... To do that, I can do it for you. So Johnson and the idea of secret writing more specifically. He is known by his followers as the prince of numbers and we're going to see why. A primary theme of Johnson's late work, probably the primary theme is secrecy. And he joked about people calling him Honest Ben. So when Stratfordians say, as they sometimes do, you people are saying Ben Johnson was a liar. No, we're saying that Ben Johnson was Honest Ben. He says so himself, get it? And as we've just seen, he assured the Earl of Pembroke of his facility with cryptography. So this is a 10-line iambic tetrameter epigram in the tradition of the mock encomium, a genre that I didn't even know about until uh, Shelley Maycock drew my attention to it. This was something that they were taught in school. It was a practice piece that they were taught to do. So what is a mock encomium? It's something that's pretending to praise where it actually, in Johnson's own words, seeks to ruin or at least to reveal a concealed solution via a comic epiphany. So let's just look at a few of the problems here. Figure is a term of rhetoric, as in figure of speech. It immediately calls attention to the constructed and artificial character of the engraving that it accompanies. The word put both reinforces the sense of something being artificially constructed and is slang for making a play in cards. And Julie Bianchini has really helped us a lot in her work on this poem. There are multiple allusions to card playing in the poem. She's the expert on that. I'm merely picking up some of the things that she has discovered. The image is not of Shakespeare, but cut for him. And he is called... The gentle Shakespeare. Gentle is a term denoting noble in the 16th century. That is the primary dictionary definition of the word gentle in this period. Art is not supposed to be in conflict with nature. Art is supposed to uh, reflect nature. It's supposed to express nature. It's supposed to reveal nature, not fight with it. In line six, we get the correct past tense of hit, uh, of hit, hit, the correct past tense of hid, suggesting that the engraving has hid his face. And I already mentioned, we've got many other terms, many other technical terms of card playing in addition to put and cut. Those are the only two most obvious ones. And it concludes, the poem inclu- concludes by instructing the reader to not look on the engraving, but the book itself to discover the author. 
And finally, just a little note about the fact that this epigram is 10 lines long. 10 is the tetractus, a, a Pythagorean triangular number. And in the tarot, 10 is the wheel of fortune. Johnson is playing a card game with fortune here in this poem. So we have numerologically invoked the wheel of fortune. We have established that his poem is playing cards with the reader. It has been suggested that the Drose Hout engraving, a figure has hid the face of the real author, whom he terms gentle or aristocratic. Is Johnson about to give the wheel of fortune a turn? Well, here's what Leah Marcus, past president of the Modern Language Association, an absolutely dedicated Stratfordian, says in her book, Puzzling Shakespeare. Shelly and I were just discussing how badly she's been ostracized for saying this. She's not being quoted. This book is not, has no profile these days among Orthodox Shakespeareans because she was a little too damn honest. She also, by the way, vigorously attacks us in this book. So that's why I'm telling you that, just so you can see what an important quotation this is. What does she say? She says, this poem starts the readers off on a treasure hunt for the real author. Where is the real Shakespeare to be found? That's exactly the question Ben Johnson wanted us to ask, and he answers it for us. One last preliminary. Why is this poem signed B.I. and not Ben Johnson? He signs his long 80-line encomium just a few pages later in the folio, Ben Johnson. Well, the answer lies in the term gematria that Alexander Waugh introduced us to in his talk, that B.I. is a numerical reality. B in gematria, in the most normal, simple, straightforward equivalence between letters and numbers, is the number two. And I is the number nine. Now, we do a little bit of manipulation on that. I've given the formula here. We take the formula B plus I is 11, followed by I, which is nine, and we repeat that formula two times in this poem and look at what we get. Ver had his wit, ver writ his book. A complete sentence, grammatically correct. This will pass the Friedman strictures. Okay, those of you who know what Friedman's did, this is Friedman compliant. I, I should say, I'm pretty sure, okay? Uh, we, we need to move forward with this and make sure that that's true. I didn't figure this out, by the way. This is the person who figured this out. Her name is Charlotte Armstrong. She's a very famous mid-20th century California writer. A writer of suspense books. Uh, very popular writer. She's someone who was somehow able to write popular books that are also deep and intellectual and profound and sell a lot of them. She puts this solution into the mouth of a character who's named simply J. The letter J is his name in the book. So Johnson's poem contains a very straightforward, aesthetically elegant Simple cryptogram discovered by Charlotte Armstrong or possibly someone that she knew who asked her to put it in this book. The result spells a complete sentence with internal rhyme. And most importantly, it explicitly addresses and answers the doubts contained on the surface of Johnson's poem, providing an answer in the treasure hunt for the real author. And this is my last slide. I could have spent some time talking about this earlier, but I chose to leave it here. Remember I said that B equals 2 and I equals 9. If you want to check that, this is... Notice that this is uh, these wheels, they're called volvels, and you can reset them. So really you can make B equal any number. And the same with J. 
but this is showing, this is how it's published. This is the default. A is one, B is two, so on and so forth. This is 1563 book. This is the book that Ben Johnson, when he mentions ciphering to Pembroke, this was his manual. This is the most important book. It's called, notice, it's difficult to translate this, but it's De Furtivis, and that is cognate with our word furtive. Okay, so this is concerning the furtive notes of literature or things concerning letters. So notice that this is uh, multi-generic. It's not just talking about spy stuff. It's talking about anybody who has a need to say something indirectly in a concealed manner. This is the go-to book. 